that virtual learning is having on our children's mental health. So I've compiled a group of mental health experts here with me today, as well as a couple of parents and one student who is actually featured in our story tonight at 11. And so to kick this off, I just wanna get started with the parents and have each of them introduce themselves to you and kind of explain what they've been going through in their families and uh, with their kids in terms of the mental health issues they've been experiencing during the pandemic and especially during virtual learning. So Jennifer, why don't we start with you, if you could give us a brief background on your story. Sure, um, my name is Jennifer Farmer. I have a ninth grader in um, Eklund Allen High School and she previously had um, been an honor student in all advanced classes, uh, mostly A's and B's. Um, a couple months into this year, we started noticing her grades drop off. Um, just no interest in school, um, not even much interest in any other things either. Um, reached out and collaborated with her pediatrician, um, started some counseling, started some, ended up starting some medication a few months after starting the counseling. Um, it was just like I had a different kid in the house that wasn't the same kid that I had before. Um, and we've continued to struggle um, throughout the last couple months and especially the last few weeks. I think we're doing a little bit better this week, but it's just a constant struggle every day. And she lives in a double healthcare provider family. So we have our own struggles with um, no options for her to go anywhere because she's in high school, because she's too old to go to any sort of program and us being out working. Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. And Christy, what's going on in your household? Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Christy Holton and I have three children in Henrico County. I've got an 11th grader, um, a seventh grader and a sixth grader. Um, my, uh, I guess my situation is a little bit unique because I have a medically fragile daughter who has heart and lung disease and a compromised airway. So she, um, we try to protect her anyway on a, on a regular basis, despite, you know, before COVID. And um, I, same similar story with Jennifer in that my two boys who are six and 11th grade uh, were completely fine. And um, now they currently have eight Fs between the two of them. And we had never seen an F before the fall. Um, my sixth grader is definitely struggling the most. Um, he had never, he had AB student before, loved school, loved history, uh, loved science. You would, and same as exactly what Jennifer said, you would not know that he's the same kid that he was in February. He is completely different. And we have started him in outside and private counseling as well. And I actually, he had a session yesterday, a little uh, more, my husband got caught COVID right after Christmas. And now, unfortunately, my daughter was diagnosed, got it, uh, she was tested positive last night. So he is, terrified, even though I'm not as worried as he is, but he just it cannot handle anything right now. And the counselor actually emailed me yesterday saying school is just not an option for him to do right now. He cannot focus on his schoolwork at all. So I feel like I've been in my kids academic business more than ever. Um, and their grades have never been worse. It's not working. Um, my 11th grader is struggling in a lot of his subjects. And he says he just can't understand that way. It's just, um, it's very frustrating. I feel like uh, people are running us over to save other people. And it's really, um, we're forgotten, we're ignored. It's, and I can't, I'm powerless to help my children. It's awful. Thank you, Christy. I'm gonna go to Kylie now, our student on this call. And Kylie, you were so brave to share your personal story uh, for our story tonight at 11 p.m. When we spoke last time, you talked about before you know, receiving counseling and taking medication, just feeling a lack of motivation, you didn't want to get out of bed. Can you tell us more about how you were feeling and even continuing to feel today when it comes to your virtual learning? Um, I feel like personally, I cannot learn like over the computer. I just feel like drained staring at a computer every hour of the day it's like 
at the end of the day, there's nothing left. Like I'm tired even today just from being on school. And it's, I feel like a lot to ask for uh, a kid, I guess, to stay on the computer and focus every single minute that you're in class. What was it like for you to have to seek out counseling and even start taking a medication to help you? Um, Starting counseling was kind of hard because I had to like trust that person, I guess, before I could talk about anything. And I've never gone on a medication for anything really before. So it was kind of just like hard, I guess, on me, like thinking that all of this just like because of her, your dog with a chew toy. It is all of that, <laughs> like virtual school, just all of it leading up to me having to start counseling and taking medication. It's just mind blowing. Well, thank you, Kylie. I want to talk now with Dr. Sood. Dr. Bellis sued from the Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU. When you're hearing these parents and this child talk about the impact of virtual learning on mental health, what's going through your mind? Well, you know, my heart goes out uh, to folks because I think that in my mind, uh, the pandemic is here and uh, schools have got to make these decisions regarding virtual versus face-to-face. -face. And unfortunately, we are all stuck with it. So uh, when I think in terms of comparative baselines, you know, you look at homeschool where there's not that uh, much of a uh, interaction between people, but yet that whole institution has worked well. But here we are, I think, stuck in a situation where people have no options. It's not a choice. You know, you're just kind of put into this situation. And I think that's where the problem really emerges because some people can kind of do it. And I've, I've really actively asked uh, young people that I treat uh, with depression and anxiety is that oftentimes this really has brought out into bold relief the difference in the way style of uh, the way people learn. So whether it's auditory, whether it's visual, you know, what is the kind of instruction that gets through to you, which is very different for different people. And this uh, platform really allows very little of latitude in individualizing it. So within a regular classroom setting, that is, you know, you're capable of it. But within this setting, I hear so many of young people complain about the fact that they don't understand the stuff. They just don't. And, and they can't really, um, so they sit there. And, and many of them have very poignantly said that this is like a lost year for them. So that's, that's a big thing for young people who are, trying to get through life to kind of say just upfront that this is just a lost year and they just give up. And so the kids with depression and anxiety particularly are, uh, it's, a, it's a problem area. And in fact, if you look at some of the surveys which have been done by the Department of uh, Behavioral Health and Development of Disabilities in Virginia, they have certainly shown that pediatricians have seen an, a great uptick in the amount of depression and anxiety that they're seeing. 60% uh, of them see an uptick in anxiety, 80% with depression. So these are not small numbers. You know, they are increasing. And although there's no causal link, uh, the temporal connection between the start of the pandemic and this increase in uh, this stuff certainly underscores the, the idea that this pandemic has really caused uh, an uptick in the, uh, if you look at the emergency room visits, although the number is, this, is less, because people are afraid of going to the ED, but the proportion of people who are seeking mental health care has increased exponentially. So in November, it was about up 34% for mental health, um, uh, you know, things in the ED. So people are suffering. They are kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, clear that this is a problem for young people. And what do you advise, Dr. Sood, what do you advise those children that are patients of yours to do to try to get through this? I think an active management of it rather than to just give up and say this is what it is, is that every individual person really has to, uh, just like Jennifer kind of noted that she sought out treatment for a young child, you know, to, to be very upfront about what your needs are and to be really asking for them to be met. And sometimes uh, the morass of systems and, and so on and so forth make it very difficult to access 
care, uh, but where it's necessary, you are the advocate for your, your child. I think it is very important for parents, uh, just as you would uh, advise people on a flight that put on your own oxygen mask before you put it on the child, is to really examine you know, where you sit with all of the frustration. Because if, if we are kind of down, which if I, if I were in the same position, I would be like very frustrated, very upset, very sad uh, that I'm not there for the kid. It's to really sit, this is a very practical advice, is to step back and sit and strategize of how you're going to approach this and to really come up with a thing which works for your child because you're the best advocate. And so uh, taking care of your own self, like, you know, all of those tips, like, um, you know, uh, step back, meditate, go out for exercise, develop some good family time with each other so that there is less of screen time. You know, those, those kinds of tips that uh, really make a family come together. And then, then take that step of accessing the system in saying, my child needs assistance. And even with the school to say, my child learns this way and that I need assistance to turn this around. Thank you, Dr. Sood. I wanna turn now to Christina and Liz. They are employees with Henrico County Public Schools. We've heard from two parents out of Henrico County as well as a student there. Um, the concerns that you heard from them, Liz and Christina, and by the way, each of you introduce yourselves before you start talking and give your title. but. Um, is this something you're hearing on a daily basis, a weekly basis in Henrico County? Excellent, thank you. Um, my name, I'm Liz Parker. I'm the Director of um, Student Support and Wellness and School Counseling here in Henrico County Public Schools. Um, my co-director, Christina Vitek, um, is joining us shortly. Um, and she is the Director of Psychological Services, Student Support and Wellness. And um, first of all, I just wanna thank parents and students for being on here today. Um, I think this constant collaboration is so important and really key to us continuing to work through the school year. Um, as school-based mental health providers, you know, we've been working with students with anxiety and depression pre-pandemic. We'll continue to work with students that are, you know, finding themselves experiencing those same challenges post-pandemic. Um, but we have definitely continued our work with students as they're experiencing different challenges now that we have switched to the virtual learning. So we've seen new challenges um, with some depression and anxiety, but like I said before, it's, it's not new to be working with students that are experiencing um, depression and anxiety. What we have seen really are more challenges with um, the kind of social isolation that virtual learning can bring with children, as well as motivation and um, kind of that loss of what they're used to as being their structured day. So those are all more symptoms that we are working with students as school-based mental health providers in the schools and with families to try to really target um, and to put some interventions and coping strategies and things in place as we kind of continue to weather this pandemic. And you are school-based. So with virtual learning, what does that mean? I mean, are kids able to seek out your um, services during this period of yes, time? absolutely. Absolutely. So our school counselors are still providing individual counseling sessions. They're still running small group counseling. They're also still going into classrooms regularly to do um, some preventative work with students through classroom counseling curriculum lessons. Our social workers and psychologists are doing the best they can to work with students individually as well. Um, currently, we're doing all of this through Teams and are limited in person. So we do have the opportunity to go in and work with some students through limited in person. And then we will continue phasing our services as schools continue phasing um, their reopening plans. So one of the um, key points in my story, I think is that there's data out of Henrico County Mental Health showing that the number of children receiving services year to year before pandemic and uh, during the pandemic increased by nearly 25%. Now, digging deeper into that data, it sounds like a lot of people are not being discharged from their treatment like they normally would. And so you have more people um, continuing on with their treatment, which is a, a big reason for that increase. Is, is that right? So those numbers were from Henrico County Mental Health. So that, that would be different data than we pull from here within our school-based mental health team. Okay, what do you what is your data showing you in terms of like are more kids seeking out services? 
So it's really interesting when schools in person, um, we see a significant number of students seeking services typically receive them in school. And so through the virtual learning, what we've seen is one, which I'm thrilled to see, we've seen many students advocating for themselves and their own mental health concerns like Kaylee. And I think that's phenomenal. That's what we want to continue seeing even post pandemic. If you're struggling, if you know a friend is struggling, please, please connect, reach out. Um, let's make sure we're connecting you to the mental health resources that are important for you to have. And so a lot of times we are typically working with students um, throughout the day in person. And what we have seen now is that a lot more of our families and parents are reaching out and able to access services to outside mental health providers. Um, a lot of this work is being done through telehealth, not in person when they're meeting with outside counselors. So it just makes it a little more accessible for some of our families and students to um, reach out and access outside mental health services as well. So, so I think there's a lot of different variables that go into that. Um, our main goal just as school-based mental health providers is to make sure that we are connecting with the students that need the support and that we're providing them with those support services that they so desperately need. And Liz, I want to bring in Christina just to see if she can offer, you know, anything additional related to Henrico County Schools and the services that are provided. Christina, you're in charge of psych, psych, psychological services. Explain what you do. Sure. Um, I'm the director of psychological services and student support and wellness. So I work alongside Liz Parker, um, directly supervising the school psychologist, but then also working overseeing the entire student support and wellness team. Uh, the school psychologists in Henrico County are part of that school based mental health team. Uh, they are itinerant, so they are not full time at schools as the school counselors are. Yeah, so I think it's interesting to hear, like from our two parents, Jennifer and Christy, they mentioned that they sought out private um, care for their children. And I'm wondering, what does it take to get in with your counselors? You know, how hard is that process or are they easily accessible? Yeah, so our space mental health providers, our school psychologists, school social workers, and school counselors are available to all students in Henrico County. Uh, we do come at our services and support with an educational lens. Um, we typically tend to become involved with students when they are having difficulty accessing their education, when there, is, when there are any barriers um, interfering with their um, access to school. And we work with them to develop those coping skills. We work with them short term, um, sometimes longer term through um, IEP counseling. Uh, we work with teachers uh, to indirectly support the students. So being able to access our services, um, we, we try to be as readily available as possible. We take um, any requests for support from teachers, from parents, from students themselves. I do think what we have seen uh, with the virtual schooling is just we've realized how fortunate we have been in the past to have such easy access and connections with our students. We would see them all day, every day. It was really easy for us to check in with them, to you know pop in the classroom, lay our eyes on them. It was easy for teachers to find us, um, you know, in the hallway, in the in the lunch break area. Um, so we were actively engaged and it allowed us to have very quick access. It's been a little more challenging this year because we are relying on um, connecting through teams and having, you know, we've put our resources out there, our email addresses, our teams links, our Schoology pages. Uh, we're communicating with our administrators, our teachers, telling them, please, if you're concerned about a student, if a parent's concerned, this is how to reach us. We're here for you. We want to be supportive, um, but it's very different uh, than just being in person and having those opportunities from, you know, 740 till 310 every day. Thank you, Christina. And Jennifer just asked if there'd be an opportunity to respond with the question. Um, yes, Jennifer, but we're going to take it elsewhere at the moment. And then at the end, we'll open it up to uh, a couple questions. Paulette, I want to go to you, Grace. We'll get to you in a second. But Paulette, I want to go to you because you're in Richmond. And so far, we've basically been talking about Henrico. And um, Richmond has opted to go fully virtual through the end of the school year, which is a little bit different from places like Henrico and Chesterfield so far. And I know that Richmond poses unique challenges in terms of um, kids and access. So I'm wondering what you guys are seeing. First of all, introduce yourself, tell us where you work, and then explain what you're seeing in terms of mental health with our Richmond students. 
Hi, so my name is Richmond, my name is Paulette Scapars, and I work with Richmond Behavioral Health Authority, which is the Community Services Board for the City of Richmond, and also serves as the fiscal and administrative um, oversight for Region 4, which is basically the greater Richmond, Virginia area. We have some regional programs that are based out of the RBHA. Um, and uh, like you shared, Melissa, yes, uh, Richmond Public Schools, I, I, we partner with Richmond Public Schools very much so, um, but I am not employed with Richmond Public Schools, um, but uh, our agency has partnered with them on any number of initiatives over these past 10 months that we've been um, in, in the midst of the COVID pandemic in order to try to um, reach children and families as best as possible. And like the parents have um, talked about on um, this call, those struggles of trying to, and the folks from Henrico Public Schools, the struggles about trying to make connections during this time period are real. And um, Kylie, I wanted to point out something that Kylie shared that I thought was very interesting in her talking about how she feels working virtually and being over a screen. And believe it or not, that's been termed, that's been, it's called Zoom fatigue. And so all of us who are working virtually and learning virtually, it, it, for, for the vast majority of us, it affects us that same way. We don't feel, um, we, we lack that connection to um, our counterparts and our peers. Um, our distractibility is higher. We lose our concentration and ability to focus after a certain amount of time. And so um, that's, that is, uh, and for children who are coming in, um, it, it can, it, who've never had problems before, it can impact them. But for the youth who also, who have, who start out with a lot of issues related to anxieties or depressions, um, that can be very impactful. And when they already have some of their ability to focus being compromised anyway, when they're trying to um, uh, connect with people and understand whatever's being taught, that can present with a lot of issues. Um, I can appreciate um, Dr. Sood's recommendation also, and, and we work with a lot of parents around their struggles in trying to find alternatives, um, especially for their younger children, because they their children may still be in a virtual learning environment and need to be at home, but they are still attempting to work outside of the home. And, and some of the struggles um, with the families we've been working with, that's been uh, very difficult. Thank you, Paulette. And Grace, I wanna bring you in for sure here. The reason I thought you would be great to have on this call is um, in what you can offer in terms of resources, what your nonprofit can offer folks who may be struggling right now. Um, first, just ex identify yourself, give us the name of your nonprofit, and then um, explain if you're hearing similar concerns from the teens that are coming in seeking services and what you can offer. Yes, thank you, Melissa. I'm Grace Gallagher. I'm the executive director of the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation, which is named after my daughter, Cameron, who suffered um, with depression and anxiety um, throughout most of her life and to high school. Um, and yes, this is all stuff that I'm hearing all over the place of parents that are calling us and reaching out and asking um, where they should know and what, what themselves and help. Um, this is a time where um, it is a tough month for a lot of people, even people that don't have a diagnosis. You've gotten through the holiday season, you know, it's still it's getting darker outside. So everybody needs to recognize right now that this is just a, a tough month. And there's something that we practice here at CKG that we say you can't heal what you don't feel. So you need to notice it and acknowledge it and then learn your way how to navigate through it. Um, some of the things we're doing at the foundation to help provide resources and do what we can to um, help everyone navigate through their mental health always, but especially now, is um, we have something called Conversations with CKG. And it is primarily for parents. It's once a month. Um, it is a Zoom 
platform. You can um, find out about it through our website or through our social media. Um, our next one is January 20th, and it's actually on screen addiction and video game addiction. We have a licensed um, practitioner that will help present. It's kind of podcast, book club type form. You do not have to have your camera on um, and you can ask questions through the chat room or live. Um, but we present a topic. Um, we have the licensed clinician kind of speak on it. And then and we um, suggest a book for the following month where we'll have this past year. We've covered parenting through the pandemic twice. Um, we've covered trauma in teens. Um, we've talked about healthy sexual conversations with your children. Um, we have also partnered with other organizations like Side by Side um, to talk about mental health in their community and how parents can help in that way. So that's the first, um, I would say the first line of defense that parents can go to for CKG right now is really check into our conversations with CKG. Um, you can just sit from your home and really learn a lot and then get a lot of resources from that. Um, the other thing we're trying to do to support the schools is that we um, have developed some digital tools kits. And the one that has been launched most recently is called Life Transitions. We all had a transition when the governor hit the lockdown in March. And a uh, transition isn't always just going to college or going into the military or going into a new job. This was an abrupt transition that was traumatic for many. Um, so we, we cover a lot of coping skills in that. Um, it is distributed virtually through the schools. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody. Um, I know Godwin has been using that over this past um, semester before they went into holiday break. Um, and we partner with CIS of Richmond and other um, schools throughout uh, Virginia. What is really important that I think that the community needs to hear right now is that the pandemic does not require perfection. And we need to recognize that. We cannot be perfect parents. We cannot be perfect teachers. We cannot be perfect students right now. We gotta do the best we can. And we need to fill our own buckets. And one of the best advice I could give everyone out there from my life experience of having children that struggle is that keep checking in. Keep checking in in the morning right where you feel over your coffee, over your breakfast, on a scale of one to 10, where am I in my mental health right now? Be honest with your kids and then let your kids rate that. And then go back at the end of the day and rate again. That way that line of communication is open. You'll see your kids, you'll see a pattern. If they're always at a one or two after a week, call your pediatrician. Um, we, we are in a mental health crisis and when this pandemic is over, we're gonna have a lot of cleanup to do and our kids are worth it and we need to take good, good care of them because this is hard. Thank you, Grace. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes left. This has been going by so quickly. Uh, I could keep it going for at least another half hour, but Jennifer or Christy or Kylie, do you have any specific questions that you would like to ask anyone on the call uh, before we wrap this up? I do. I, guess, <laughs> I have more of a, I guess it's more of a statement and a question if they can, um, if any of the mental health experts can weigh into it. But I heard words such as advocate and active management. And I feel like um, Christy and I happen to be parents that have the ability to do that. We can tap into outside resources. We can email our teachers. We are, we are actively managing this situation. And um, Christy has had to be more of an advocate than maybe any of us have ever had to be with her medically fragile daughter. And um, what about all the kids that can't that aren't doing that. We have no idea how many kids we're missing or aren't, you know, catching before a tragedy happens. And um, I, I appreciate everything all of the mental health, of, you know, people on here and out in the community are doing. And um, Grace, everything that your foundation is doing, I think it's amazing what you have done. Um, it just really worries me that these children are so vulnerable right now and they're still having all of normal life happen to them on top of this. And so it just takes the smallest thing for something and a kid that you never thought would end up in a tragic situation. It's just pushing them over the edge now and it's really, um, really scary. And like Christy said, I think as parents, we feel like, you know, in order to protect all these other people, we're, we're sacrificing our kids. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Great point there. Does anybody have anything they want to say in response to that? Because I think a lot of people worry about kids do, that do not have parents that are advocating on their behalf or are super involved. And even sometimes with the kids whose parents are active and super involved, like Jennifer said, it, it only takes something small to trigger something tragic. So I, I would uh, agree with everything that Jennifer said. You know, mental health uh, uh, access has always been a national disaster. Uh, I, I do feel that it's a problem across the board, but the pandemic has pushed it over the edge. I do feel that, and to trying to be helpful here, is that one of the things that Virginia is doing is a, a program called the Vent uh, Virginia Mental Health Access Program, in which we are really um, tooling the pediatricians to um, work on uh, or to be adept at managing mental health, uh, um, you know, issues that come up for their for the patients because they aren't taught that in medical school. So a VMAP mm -hmm. is a really good resource and I would lean on the pediatrician uh, for access to mental health uh, because they can pick up the phone and immediately call a child psychiatrist. The VMAP program allows that. So that's a wonderful resource for, for our uh, Central Virginia area uh, so that the pediatrician does feel more adept at addressing the, the, the problem. Because one of the things with the pandemic has been that we have to acknowledge that 34% of the mental health care which is given is school-based. So when you are not in school, you are in, in, in big trouble because you're now that, that portion, that sliver of uh, the availability of mental health input is lost. And so you really have to look at alternatives. And pediatricians being people who have known your children right from birth, are, are in a perfect uh, position, uh, even if they don't know what to do, to really uh, sort of ask for assistance. And they can do that through the BMAP program. I, I have another uh, resource I would love to share with this group and to the larger community. And that's that um, we have started at brand new on January 4th, a shared mobile crisis line in our greater region four area. And so whether you are Richmond, Henrico, Chesterfield, Hanover, uh, Goochland, Powhatan, Petersburg, we serve all of this greater Richmond, Virginia area. And it is, again, it is a mobile crisis response line. Um, so I, if, if I can give the number, I would love Absolutely, to please do. It's an 833 number, so it's 833-968-1800. And there are clinicians who man that line um, and will uh, talk with uh, any referral source, whether it's a teacher or whether it's a parent or whether it's a young person themselves to try to help to step them through if someone is feeling um, in a state of crisis and needs some assistance. This is not necessarily to take the place of all of the emergency services divisions that are within our local areas, but is supplemental and is really focused on our youth. So Thank I just you. wanted to share that resource. Thank you, Paulette. And Liz, it looked like you had something to say. We have a heart out here coming up in a few minutes. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I did want to note, similar to Richmond, I, I don't know that people are aware, but a, most of the school divisions are have a very, very close working partnership with their community service board. So in Henrico, we work very, very closely with Henrico Mental Health and other outside providers. And so um, we, we work hard to advocate for students as well. So I think some of the discourse has kind of made this us against them kind of mentality. But in the schools, we are trying to advocate for students, you know, as well. So if we see students that aren't engaged or students whose cameras are not, you know, for all sorts of variety of reasons, we are putting systems in place so that we can then advocate for that student. We can reach out, we do home visits. I mean, there are all sorts of things that we can do. Um, I don't want parents to feel alone in their advocacy for their students and for their students' mental health. Please, your school-based mental health providers are your partners, and we are here to help you in any way we can. And advocating for your students' mental health and making those connections to community resources, um, that's absolutely something that we're here to do. Thank you so much, Liz. Yeah. Thank you to, uh, Christina, did you wanna add? Are we good here? Melissa, may I just add something really quick for the students? There is a national crisis text line that um, you can text um, if you're feeling in, like you're in trouble. Again, it's not 
for the um, emergency room visit or anything like that, but there's sometimes our kids are up at two o'clock in the morning and they're spinning. And if they can proactively get a little bit of help to get through the next couple of hours, it's really important. So I know it's crisistechline.com, but there is, um, you text HOME to 741741, and it is a, um, a crisis text line that will help you out at that time. Awesome. Thank you. For sharing. Melissa, I know we have a hard out and Liz did a beautiful job sort of recapping, but to Ms. Farmer, you know, your point is so well taken and made and we are worried about those kids as well. The kids that don't have advocates and they're the ones that we're staying up worrying about at night and trying to re-engage and connect with and, you know, really we're in this profession because we all care about kids and we want to support them and, and we worry as much as you know, the next person. So we do have re-engagement teams at all of our schools. Our school social workers, as Liz said, have been boots on the ground trying to connect with those students and connect them with the supports they need. So please, you know, spread the word. As Liz said, we are here and we want to want to support our kids as best as possible. Well, I am thankful that we have all of you in our region to help folks and that we could do this virtual town hall so we could let people know what is available to them in terms of resources in um, the various localities and in the school systems, et cetera. Jennifer and Christy and Kylie, thank you for being brave and sharing your personal stories. That is just incredible. And I'll look forward to everyone's reaction to the story tonight at 11 p.m. And hopefully we can help some folks. See y'all later. Thank you.